I'm the one that put the music, one that's uh, spoken of, one that's talked about, discussed, one that's heard at a funeral, usually at the graveside, not always, but um, one of my memory chapters was we had to learn the 23rd Psalm. It is a Psalm of David. For you and me, it's not a big deal that he would talk about a shepherd and sheep, uh, but it is a big deal in David's day, and it's a big deal in Jesus's day. And when uh, when you get the the how bad it was for uh, shepherds before David came along, a shepherd was regarded as well as a farmer is today. Uh, one of my favorite quotes years ago when farmers had it worse than they do now and they don't have it much better than they did then was uh, was the surgeon general's warning warning farming may be hazardous to your wealth uh that was kind of the way it was for a shepherd until david came along and he made it so popular and yet people some people have gotten insulted over the years by being regarded as a lamb and the misnomer is that lamb are stupid, dumb creatures. They're really not. They're very intelligent creatures. However, when God designed them, he designed them to be together. He designed them to fight together. He designed them to care. Uh, but lambs are so susceptible to anything. They don't pay any attention where they're going. Uh, they, they don't, I mean, for example, you get one on their back, you've caught them. They can't turn over. They cannot get up from being on their back. The shepherd has to go over and turn them sideways. And they, uh, they are uh, very intelligent creatures in that they can recognize about eight different sounds. But a lamb's very unique, though, in that a lamb only knows it's shepherd or those other seven people. You cannot, you cannot walk up to a set of lambs, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and get a lamb to just recognize your voice. They will walk away from you. They will get away from you. They will get in a pack. They will try to help another lamb that's hurt, or, or they'll try to fight together. That's the only way they know how to fight. And so when David compares these uh, to compares us to lambs, he's not trying to be insulting, but a lamb is very dependent on its shepherd. Well, guess what? We're very dependent on our shepherd. And if we're not, we're in serious trouble. In fact, we won't even have eternal life if we're not dependent on our shepherd. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We pray that we handle your word correctly. We pray, Father, that you will be with us as we study. We pray that we will have an open mind, open heart to receive your word, to be a little better than when we came. Father, our hearts and minds go to people like Debbie and who's still in the hospital but doing much better, and we're glad about that. We pray for her continued recovery. Father, for people that are dealing with COVID, we pray that you will help them to get better. Pray that you'll be with my best friend who is in hospice right now, and hopefully things can change. Heard some good news today. And Father, maybe that will continue to progress, and he'll be out of that before long. Father, we pray for others that, that have lost loved ones, and we just pray for your comforting hand to be on them. For those who are dealing with this ice frigid weather that is coming to at least the east side of the state, and then the central part of the country and eventually move east. Father, we know that winter is very hard on people. We know that you're in charge of the changing seasons. We know, Father, that you you remind us of that frequently. We thank you that you're in charge and in control. Pray you'll be with our leaders, that they will rule as you want them to. They'll stop acting like brats, in my opinion, and start acting like the people we elected them to be, our representatives. And we just pray you'll continue to be with us tonight. Thank you for the greatest blessing we've ever received, and that is your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now, when you look at the very first verse, 
there's a song that we don't sing very often, but we've heard it frequently. If you go to a Catholic mass uh, or you go to a, another denominational uh, mass and it's a, uh, and it's our uh, service and it's called the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want it's in part of the rituals that are, are stated. And, um, and, and it, it's a very pretty song. And the design is to remind us of how good we have it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I, I like the international version. There's nothing I lack. I believe the new new living translation says there's nothing I need. Uh, the reason is, is because we know from the book of Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 through 20, we have all our needs met. Now the question always comes up incidentally, then why do I have to ask God for anything if he knows what my needs are? Well, because he said, ask James chapter four, verse one, the I shall not want is actually the topical sentence of the entire poem. The concept of a topical sentence is it controls what the paragraph is. A lot of times students will say something like this and I kind of get tickled. They'll say, a paragraph, that's got to be three to five sentences, right? <laughs> well, yeah, but what's your topical sentence? What's a topical sentence? It's what controls the paragraph. All right, same thing here. The concept of what David is getting at is there's nothing that I don't already have or I don't already need that God will not or has not supplied. One of the reasons that they're the main reason this is said at funerals is verse four, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, and, and I grew up thinking verse four, because I never heard anybody talk about it before, that there is just a what we call an allegory, an illusion, a, a symbol to get us to to uh, to go to think about that. But it, there's actually a shadow of death. Hang on to that thought. The Lord is the shepherd, and we are the sheep. Now, that's not an insult. That is not designed to be an insult. That is designed to show a relationship, a relationship between the sheep and the shepherd. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that dad, and he didn't even know it, but dad and his ag class went out with Mr. McMines. Mr. McMines taught in my home school for 42 years. And everybody knew Mr. McMines. The parents knew Mr. McMines. He was a great fellow. Uh, age just caught up with him, unfortunately. But they were out at this place that this guy had some sheep. And they had permission to be there. And and they were going to study about sheep a little bit. Well, Mr. McMines kept saying, you've got to be quiet. You've got to be quiet. Well, one of dad's best friends is worse than his oldest son. He's just, da, 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 by the way, I'm, I'm dad and mom's oldest son, in case you didn't know, pick that up. Da, 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 and he's just talking at the top of his lungs. Mr. McBine says, Joe Adam, or Joe, not Joe Adam, sorry, I had somebody else in mind. Joe, I'm going to tell you for the last time, shut your mouth. You're going to spook these sheep. They don't know you. Well, you know, Joe, if you knew anything about him, he just kept on and kept on and kept on. And dad said, I've been around cows. I've been around pigs. I've been around all kinds of animals. He says, that's the first time in my life I watched lambs all together running at us. And he said, we, we started moving over. Joe was still talking when all of a sudden he noticed the lamb when they said, Joe, look out. And the sheep were running directly at him. And he said, all he, dad said, all he did was screamed out. Ah! 
He said, I thought they were going to run over him. He said they ran right by him and just kept on running as far as they could run. That's why it is so important for the sheep to know the shepherd. That's why it's important for the shepherd to know the sheep. And while this may sound mean, it's not intended to be. You, you can tell when someone doesn't know the shepherd. You can tell when someone's not a lamb, though they got the lingo down. You know, I believe. I asked a fellow one time when he said that to me, I said, well, what do you believe? What do you mean? I said, what do you believe? Well, I believe in Jesus. I said, what do you believe in Jesus about? Well, you've never been asked that question before. And I'm sure he did believe in Jesus. That's not what I'm getting at. But the children of Israel in Hebrews chapter 3 could not go into the promised land because they didn't believe in God. They couldn't go into the promised land because they didn't believe God. In other words, they called God a liar. John chapter 10, first 18 verses talks about this. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. A hireling doesn't care for the sheep. But what will a shepherd do? A shepherd will get in there and kill the predator. Is that not what David said in 1 Samuel 17 whenever Saul said, oh, you can't go out there and, and you, can't, you can't defeat that giant. And he said, I want you to know that the Lord delivered me from the mouth of the bear and he delivered me from the mouth of the lion and I'm going to kill that uncircumcised Philistine. He's going to deliver me from him. And David did. You can read about that. He would, he would literally kill the predator. That's what a shepherd will do. He will also be willing to die for the sheep. Jesus talked about this in John 15. I'm sorry, uh, in, uh, um, yeah, John 15. You got 100 sheep. One of them goes missing. So what does he do? He leaves the 99 there. He goes and finds the one lost lamb. And what does he do? He not only finds the one lost lamb, he puts it on his shoulders and carries it back. That's a pretty good shepherd, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, one of my favorite, it's kind of a, an irony of life. When, you're, when you fit in the shopping cart, you don't want in it. When you can't fit in the shopping cart, that's all you want, you want in it. <laughs> I told a kid one day, uh, we were at Walmart and saw a friend of ours and a little boy, and oh, he just wanted out. He just wanted out. He just wanted out. Until I said, I'll tell you what, you get out and I'll get in. And he goes, what? I said, you get out and I'll get in. I don't want to walk. I want to ride. Oh, he thought riding was cool then. <laughs> Somebody carries me like that when I'm down, when I'm susceptible to death, I'm susceptible to sickness, I'm susceptible to all this stuff. Oh, 1 Peter 2.25 says he's the shepherd that takes care of us. He's the one who oversees our souls. And by the way, Peter, along with Paul, put it into context about how an eldership is supposed to be with the congregation. They don't rule over, and there's some elders that don't get this, they don't rule, they serve. In other words, they take care of the sheep. They, they just don't rubber stamp what a preacher does. And they get in there and they, they make sure that the truth's being taught. They make sure that the truth's being adhered to. They make sure that all this stuff's taking place. But, but the Bible uses this concept of a shepherd and a sheep. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Well, that's simply this concept. There's always safety with the Lord. 
Now, I know there's a, a conception out there, especially from our Baptist friends, that we don't believe in eternal security. Now, what we don't believe in is once you're saved, you're always saved. Because Paul said in Galatians 5, 4, you've fallen from grace. Titus left. Crescens left. They left the church. Now, they have, they have the opportunity to come back. That's not the point. And we always emphasize that. But uh, let, me, let me illustrate it like this. A friend of mine was trying to convince me that we were studying and talking. And I said, so, so he said, well, it doesn't mean what you think it means. I said, okay. So let me ask you this. If I go out and rape a woman and kill her and then kill myself and I'm saved, as you say, do I have eternal life? And he goes, yes. I said, that makes no sense because I've violated God's law. God's grace is not a blank check so that I can do whatever I want. However, God's grace always outweighs, outgrows, outpaces our sin. And that's so hard for us to understand sometimes because we think that this is dependent on us for salvation when it's dependent on God. He, with, the Lord is our shepherd because we're following the shepherd. See, when, when you're with a shepherd, you don't have to worry about, about anything. You don't have to worry about what you're eating. You don't have to worry about what you're feeding on. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about any of it. For example, sheep sometimes will eat grass. According to Philip Keller in his book, A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm, sometimes sheep want to get into grass that's going to get in their intestinal system and kill them. So what does a shepherd do? He goes up in front of the sheep. And he makes sure where they're going to feed is good grass. Well, we've got a God who, who, while he doesn't give us grass necessarily, he gives us food. He gives us food to eat, water to drink, and has found this book right here. If we'll just follow this book. And like one man said one time who, who fought the Lord and, and fought the Lord, I asked him one day, I said, can you... Can you answer me a question, Larry? And he said, sure. I said, how did you obey the gospel? And he smiled at me and he says, Dwayne, it's there in black and white if you'll just read it. I said, amen. Amen. But that's what we don't tend to do. Uh, in fact, I was talking to the kids today and I said, Did anybody read newspapers? And a couple of them raised their hand, quite surprised me, sixth graders. And I said, uh, and the rest of them went, that's what I was used to <laughs> because who reads newspapers today? Of course, we read them on the phone anymore, but, uh, but some, some uh, read it, read the hard copy. Now, there's an inside joke in our family. Doesn't mean much to y'all, but you'll get the point that we're a bedlam family. I am the only one in the house that supports the Sooners, Oklahoma Sooners. And the other three support the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Now, I support the Oklahoma State Cowboys till they play my Sooners. And my daughter especially loves to tell me this joke. Do you know what's God's university? And of course, I pretty well have an idea what she wants to tell me. I just don't know why yet. And she'll say, well, it's Oklahoma State. Now, the home of Oklahoma State University is Stillwater, Oklahoma. And, she'll, and she turned around and she said, well, Dad, don't you know the Bible says he leads me beside still water? And I go, no, he leads me beside still waters. <laughs> a lamb will not drink water from, a moving, from moving water. They'll starve to death before they drink it. They are terrified of moving water. They think that that moving water is going to get them somehow, some way or that there's something in that water and they will not touch it. Even though you and I know that there's nothing harmful in that water. Yes, Jackie.
that's true too. Yeah, their wool and their wool will sink and they and they yeah, they'll drown. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they will drink from still water. And that's where God leads us. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6 35, and I am the water of life, John 4 14. And if we don't want the bread of life, and we don't want the water of life, we're in trouble. Because what are we following? We're following somebody besides Jesus. And there are people out there teaching things that just aren't true. But because they either have a celebrity status or they have a reverend in front of their name, people just believe whatever they say. Um, for example, Steve Harvey said the other day, Jesus is not the only way to eternal life. I know what his mama would be doing. His mama would be paddling him. I don't care how old he is, because his mama was a, was, knew Jesus is the only way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. The I am is Yahweh. The idea is the eternal. So um, he leads us in righteousness. And the reason is, is because he's righteous. Now, what is the word? That's always been a church term. And when I got a little bit older, I went, what in the world does righteousness mean? Somebody said justice. Well, I know what justice is, but how do you reconcile the two words righteousness and justice here? Well, take the E-O-U-S, any -E -S, S off the word, and the root word of it is right. Uh, when, when I was called to testify in a, in a court trial a few years ago, the attorney it was an attorney's trick I learned later, but it's the first time I'd ever been in any courtroom. I'm sitting over here, and he's looking out this window. And he asked me, he says, how far is it to the neighbor's house to the south? Had I taken a tape measure and measured it? No. I did some guesses. The plaintiff was laughing at me the whole time. I can't believe the judge didn't tell her to quit. But how about to the north? I, and I said, and where he got in trouble was, how about to the east? I said, which one? And he said, to the east. And I said, which one? Which one? And he goes, to the east. And I said, which one? Your Honor, would you please instruct the witness to answer the question? And the judge said, would you please? I said, Your Honor, I'd love to answer the question. I said, what you're not understanding is if you take Main Street, El Dorado, Oklahoma, you're going to run right into the front door of their house. So the neighbor to the south side of, of Main Street is so many feet. The neighbor to the north side of the street is so many feet. I don't think anybody lives in that house. They do now, but at the time they didn't. So you tell me, sir, which one do you want? No further questions. <laughs> God's right. God's always right. Well, what if I don't like the fact that he's right? <laughs> well, sometimes I don't like the fact that the doctor's right. <laughs> uh, sometimes I don't like the fact that, that when people tell me I'm wrong, or sometimes I'll catch myself. Yesterday, I caught myself doing something I shouldn't have done and I, because I didn't see the person that was on the screen right. I immediately emailed her and apologized to her. We were in a meeting. And she said, oh, no problem. Well, it was. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have stated it the way I stated it. I didn't mean for it to come out the way it did. But anyhow, I did. That's no excuse. And sometimes you just, you're wrong. And you need to be, have that pointed out. It's not a bad thing. God leads in righteousness. John 17, 25, Jesus said in his valedictory address that you are righteous. Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. Why? Because in it is the righteousness of God contained therein. And by the way, I said a few weeks ago, Habakkuk 1, 4 is where that quote's from. Let's try that again, Habakkuk 2, 4. I apologize. Uh, and so here he is. He, he leads us, James 1, 19 and 20. 
Sometimes we have this backwards. James says, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Well, we sometimes have this all backwards. The first thing we're supposed to do is we're supposed to get wrathful. Or we're supposed to talk first. Remember the church, we were talking one time and in a meeting. And this young lady at the Bible chair that he had a problem with, and he didn't realize what he said, but I guess he'd been treated. I guess he had been given the courtesy for years and years. Well, his first words out of his mouth is, "Now look, we're going to get this settled, and we're going to get this settled right now." What kind of tone do you think that sets during the meeting? I'm not going to answer the question for you. <laughs> and I said, and I said, with her. And he goes, yeah. And I said, you didn't get anywhere, did you? And he kind of sheepishly got embarrassed. He said, no, I was wrong. I said, because with her, it's like a bull in a china closet. She used to make fun of, of a guy because he talks like I do. I called her a Yankee one time. And she says, I'm no Yankee. I said, then stop making fun like Yankees do of Southern people. And she made fun of him again. He called, he was talking about uh, Gene Autry. And of course he said it intentionally, Gene Artery. Well, there wasn't anything wrong with that. It's just the way he said it. And she laughed and ridiculed him, made fun of him. I'm like, why are you making fun? There's no sense in that. But we tend to want to talk. We don't want to listen. Or we want to get wrathful first, and then you're going to listen to me. And then, you know, I don't understand why nobody won't, doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> like that lady I told you about that I have partial hearing loss in this ear because she screamed at me for five minutes, then couldn't figure out why I didn't want to talk to her. Well, if you're going to scream at me, I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. Yea, though I walk, verse 4, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there is a literal valley of death. Now, that shepherd knows two things. First of all, it's his responsibility to keep that lamb out of there. And he's very good if he does his job right. He's very good at keeping that lamb out of there. Or if he's leading that lamb through, that lamb just goes and doesn't worry about a thing because you got the shepherd leading or you got the shepherd behind. If a lamb gets out of line, you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That shepherd is so good with his rod, it's usually got an iron tip on the end of it. They throw that, that staff and when it lands on the ground, that lamb will go the other way. But that lamb knows that there's a reason for it. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, of uh, one time we were at, bat, at football game. Christopher wasn't, but what, I'm two weeks old? And we're standing there or sitting there at the game. And, and somebody said to me, uh, where's your son? I said, beats me. They said, you're not worried about your son? I said, with 13 grandmas around here? Oh, I ain't, nobody's got a chance. And people would hold him and, hey, you know, they'd all, and, and he started crying. Nobody could get him to quit. And I said, Christopher, it's all right. All of a sudden, he just quit. He, he didn't have any issue the rest of the game. In fact, he didn't get excited when people got excited when Colvary was, was scoring. He didn't get, I mean, you know, people just, and like I said, he got passed here, 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 and then who took him home? I did, because Mama wasn't feeling good that night. And, and Bree was playing with her friends. You know what? That's the idea here. Jesus put it another way uh, over in Matthew 18. We got to have the heart of a child to be a part of the kingdom. Well, 
Paul said something similar about this whole concept in Philippians 4. And bless our hearts, and I say ours, we're not very good at following this one sometimes. We're good at following it sometimes, but not always. Be anxious for nothing. Well, Lord, you got to understand. I, uh, I was sitting on the side of the road. And I, my kids were there, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Well, the Lord understands that. <laughs> we're human. He doesn't excuse it, but we understand that. A um, little uh, man one time was walking with his daughter. They were walking home. I think it was from a school event. It wasn't very far to their house. It was nice weather, and all of a sudden, this thunderstorm got up, and it was lightning. And every time the bolt of lightning would hit, she'd grab her dad, and he said, are you afraid of lightning? And she goes, uh-huh. He said, well, I kind of am too. He says, but you know, he said, why don't you pretend what my dad and mom used to tell me, that God's taking your picture when the lightning happens. She wasn't sure about it. And so the next time it was lightning, she goes, all the way home. Dad said it was the most pleasant walk that ever had because she stopped being afraid. Well, you know, little kids aren't afraid of anything. We're the ones that get afraid. As long as the shepherd's there, the sheep don't have any anxiety. When, do the shep when does the sheep get anxious? The sheep get anxious when the shepherd's not around and somebody's not somebody that's not supposed to be there. Uh, kind of uh, maybe a crude illustration a little bit, but kind of reminds me of our dogs around here. Um, we know somebody is either walking around or doing something that or just walking up down the street. We got seven dogs across the street. We got two over here and then unfortunately we have the one in our backyard, but She's, she's in the house, but we know usually she's barking. When she's barking, there's some. And the other day, I looked out the door, and this kid, I don't know who he was, it, he was running, and all of a sudden he walks up behind our trailer, touches the back of the trailer, and then runs on. And then another kid was running toward Lotteberger to meet his parents. I, I still don't know what that was about. I don't know if that was track uh, cross country well they're not having track this year but i don't know what that was but as soon as he got away the, you know dogs quit uh it gets annoying sometimes the, to hear it but you know at the same time you know when the dogs aren't barking things are pretty well quiet now we got one dog across the street that he just i don't know if he's part wolf or what but he just howls till <laughs> until the sun comes up <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> now, I want you to go to Zechariah chapter 11. That's the next to the last book of the Bible. And I want you to see about this rod and staff. And it's a prediction of Jesus, prophecy of Jesus, Zechariah chapter 11. We'll come back to Psalm 23, I promise. But if you'll go up to Zechariah 11 and verse number 4. Now, he, he's already got on their case, the shepherd's case, because they haven't been doing their job. But then he turns and he says, verse 4, Thus says the Lord my God, Feed the flock for a slaughter, whose owners slaughter them and feel no guilt. Who, those who sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich, and their shepherds do not pity them. For I will no longer pity the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord, but indeed I will give everyone into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of this king. They shall attack the land, and I will not deliver them from their hand. So I fed the flock for slaughter. In particular, the poor of the flock, I took for myself two staffs. One I call beauty, and the other I call bonds. This refers. This would refer back to uh, this illustration about this rod and staff. I fed the flock. I dismissed the three shepherds in one month. My soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. And I said, I will not feed you, 
Let what is dying die, and what is perishing perish. Let those who that are left eat, eat each other's flesh. And I took my staff, beauty, and cut it in two, that I may break the covenant which I had made with all the peoples. So it was broken on that day. And thus the poor of the flock who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said to them, if it's agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And does that remind you of anybody that got betrayed? And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. Does that remind you of what Judas did? That princely, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter, and I cut into my other staff bonds that I may break the brotherhood between Jerusalem and Judah, or excuse me, Judah and Israel. And the Lord said to me, next take for yourself the implements of a foolish shepherd, for indeed I will raise up a shepherd in the land who will not care for those who are cut off, nor seek the young, nor heal those that are broken, nor feed those that still, still stand, but he will eat the flesh of the fat and tear their hooves in pieces. Woe to the worthless shepherd who leaves the flock, a sword will be against his arm and against his right eye. His arm shall completely wither and his right eye shall be totally blinded. This idea of rod and staff, Zechariah says, I broke, broke it in two. And I broke it in two, try to get these shepherds to understand they're not doing their job. Well, that's the whole point of this, that we have a wonderful shepherd who is doing his job. And whether or not you like to admit it, even Bible characters like Job, like David, had the question, is God doing his job? Is God really doing his job? And we know the answer to that. The last two verses say, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Dr. Keller says that what this would indicate is that when you bring the sheep in, you, you bring them into the fold and you go through and, and you check them. For example, let's say that one of the, one of the lambs gets a, a cut. Well, you take that lamb and you set it apart from the rest of them. You go over and you doctor that lamb with whatever it is they had. Uh, let's say another one gets some animal, some uh, pestle or uh, some bug or something on it. You go over and take care of that and you separate it from the rest of the lambs. And what the lambs know, what the sheep know is, is that shepherd is not only concerned for their welfare, but he's also taking care of their needs. Well, <laughs> surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. One can't help but think that this is an allusion to the Lord's Supper as well. Because when Jesus said, this is my body, and this is my blood, well, how, how else are we saved except the blood and the body? Now, I know there are people that, that think you can be saved without the church, but that's a misconception because the church is Jesus' body. So if you want Jesus, you got to have the church. Romans 8, 31 through 39 are those great questions. Those three questions that come up. If, first of all, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who's going to separate us from the love of God? There's only one person that can separate you and me from the love of God, and that's you and me. I can't separate you from the love of God. You can't separate me from the love of God, but I can separate me from the love of God, and you can separate you from the love of God. And unfortunately, we know of people that have done that. Uh, some of these examples that would fit this would be when, they, when Joseph saved the people of Israel, he becomes number two in Egypt. The only one he has to answer to is, is Pharaoh. And he prepares the people for seven years of good, or with the seven years of good for the seven years of famine that's coming up. And it got so bad that... that uh, uh, they became government workers 
Uh, that's what they had to do to be able to eat. They'd sold their land, they'd sold their livestock, they'd sold everything to Egypt. Um, Matthew 14, when Jesus would feed the approximate 5,000. Luke 14, when uh, Jesus tells the, the parable of the invited wedding guest, then that's also in Matthew 21, uh, 22. And you look in, in, Math, in Revelation 19, I didn't put this in the notes, but blessed are those who are invited to the marriage. That is, blessed are those who are part of the bride, because the bride is the church, and the groom is Jesus. When he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now, that doesn't mean that... Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not going to have bad days. I don't mean by that, that that we have rotten days, but I do mean by that David talked about some bad days. You know, people sometimes romanticize Christianity, and that's one of the problems we've got. We shouldn't be romanticizing anything. We should be real. Uh, we should be real people. That is, oh, Christian. You know, Christianity is just the most wonderful life, and it is, but Christianity is just the most carefree life. Wait a minute. No. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, we got an enemy who tries everything he can to make sure that we don't have a carefree life. However, like the old song says, often I'm hindered on my way burden so heavy I almost fall then I hear Jesus sweetly say heaven will surely be worth it all heaven will surely be worth it all worth all the strife that here befall after this life with all its strife heaven will surely be worth it all and that's the idea here when you read about uh, in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 David doesn't even have any place in Hebrews except for one part. And that is the time would fail me to tell you about Jephthah and Gideon and Samson and David. And you're like, wow, you know, Hebrew writer, you could have spent another chapter on David. <laughs> because who's David? Acts 13, he's a man after God's own heart. Why is he a man after God's own heart? Because when God pointed out his sin, for example, we're going to look at this before long. In Psalm 53, he admitted it. He didn't admit it because he got caught. He admitted it because he knew it was true. And he repented of it. I've sinned against you and you alone. But it didn't take away the consequences. Because when Nathan told him, the child born to you, the son born to you will die, David tried everything he could to talk God out of that. He fasted. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't do the normal things that he did, and yet he could tell when the child died. And he says one of the most beautiful things in, in 1 Samuel or 2 Samuel 12, and that is, I, the child will not return to me, but I'll go to the child. They thought he lost his mind before his child, before the son died, and after the son died. He didn't lose his mind either time, but he knew the reality. He's going to where the sun is. And we know that David is buried, according to Acts chapter 2. Na nature would tell you that anyway, but Acts chapter 2, he, his tomb was still there. The one resurrected from the dead was Jesus. And when Jesus uses the term in John 10, it's not a put down. Our Mormon friends, unfortunately, use that to say the latter days. Well, <laughs> the latter days are e is from the Greek word eon, the last age. That's the one we're in. And so we have a shepherd. And we've got to be sheep that follow the shepherd. Anything you wanted to add to that tonight? Those are some of our thoughts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time tonight. We pray that we've used it wisely. And Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for its authenticity, its accuracy, and its inerrancy. We just thank you, Father, that it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. 
that we can follow it, that we can do what you want, that you will be very proud and pleased. Father, we pray that we will follow the shepherd as the shepherd's leading us home. And Father, we want to go home. This is not our home. We're just passing through. We just pray you'll forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. I thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you.